I was asked to come and share a story that's taken basically a lifetime to unfold in 15 minutes. So it starts several decades ago in Orange County. For those of you who are old enough, you'll remember that girls were very yucky in those days. <laughs> Julie's mom, Maxine, babysat, my, babysat me in those days when my parents worked. So we spent a lot of time together. Julie and I went to uh, preschool together, Sunday school together. We were in Mrs. Pike's first grade class together. Julie told her mom once that she was going to marry Scott Brusaw, but I thought she might have cooties, and I had no, no, nothing to do with that. <laughs> Back then, my favorite toy was a slot car. And basically, slot cars, it's an electric road. The electricity is in your, your toy track there, and it powers your little electric cars. And I thought if we made real roads electric, and this was the thought of maybe a six-year-old, that we could, kids could drive and relieve our parents of that awesome responsibility. <laughs> When I was eight, my family packed up and moved to Ohio. We grew up apart, but we graduated about the same time. We stayed pen pals through the years. When we graduated from high school, we were 2,000 miles apart. I decided to join the Marines. Julie went off to study psychology. So in our own independent ways, we decided to surround ourselves with crazy people. <laughs> A couple years later, now we're in the late 70s, I'm stationed in North Carolina and I got orders to be transferred to Okinawa. And I knew just enough geography to know that California was on the way to Okinawa from North Carolina. So we hadn't seen each other in 10 years, so I arranged to stay with her and her family for a few days. This was about the same time that Jimmy Carter was putting solar panels on top of the White House. And as you can see, Julie's dad used better film than the Associated Press back then. <laughs> I'm going to fast forward quite a, a few years. We're married now. We're living up in North Idaho at the base of the Rocky Mountains where the air is clean, the birds are singing, life is good, the world is perfect. Or so we thought. Al Gore comes along and tells us it's not. He tells us of things like global warming, CO2, and we start hearing this in the news every night, you know, several years ago. It wasn't going away. I can, I'll be honest with you, I ignored it back then. I wasn't an environmentalist. I hated the litter bugs just like everybody else. Julie was the environmentalist, talked me into studying up on this. Because years later, now I've got uh, electrical engineering degrees, which is great for that electric road idea. Julie's got her psychology degrees. But we're trying to figure out, an engineer fixes things. We solve problems. But nobody was solving this. We kept hearing it in the news every night. Why was it? You know, it's not electrical engine. I'm thinking, this is in the atmosphere. This is climate. Why doesn't somebody fix this? So we decided to educate ourselves on it. The CO2 from burning fossil fuels, not only coal, but from our cars, you know, it started to unfold. We started to realize there's reasons it isn't being fixed. There's no easy solution here. While we were doing this studying on climate and all the problems in the world, other things came up. Like, we learned that roughly 65,000 children a day die just because they can't get clean drinking water. Then there was the whole peak oil thing going on, running out of oil. And Julie had known all this for years and convinced me. And when our ed we got started getting educated, I started to open my eyes. And I became a changed man. <laughs> <laughs> so one day we're out in our garden. Julie turns, we were discussing what we learned about global warming and the CO2 problem. And she turned to me and she said, couldn't you make your electric roads out of solar panels? I laughed and said, no, you can't drive on a solar panel. You'd crush it. They're very fragile. But then we started talking about what if we could make a structurally engineered case that could withstand the static and dynamic forces of an 80,000-pound truck flying at 80 miles an hour with tire chains and flipping over, jackknifing, and skidding across the road. What if we could make something like that? So we started thinking of the black boxes they have in airplanes that survive airplane crashes. If we could make something like that, that we could put things in and lay it down on the road, we could make solar panels that you can drive on. You could make something that you could put solar cells inside of. Now, this is where it started getting exciting. We started bouncing off the walls or bouncing these ideas off. If we can make this case, we can put anything in there. So now we can collect energy that, on a road that we can drive on. But we live in North Idaho, about an hour from the Canadian border, and we get a lot of snow. We can't let snow accumulate on it or it stops producing. So we think we can put a heating element in the surface. Now, heating elements like this, this is the windshield or the back window of a car. That's been around for decades. Solar panels, we just showed you on top of the White House, have been around for decades. All this technology we're putting in here has been around forever. 
except for that top surface, which we've got three universities working on. We start getting excited. What else can we put in here? Well, we're getting to the age where we can't see at night very well. We live on a very long and winding road up in the mountains. You have mixed rain in there. I can't even see the edge of the road. What if we put LEDs in there? Light it up like a runway so I can see around. It'll be like driving on a video game. <laughs> this is the fun part of engineering. This is the brainstorming section. Well, if we're going to have LEDs, we have to have a microprocessor board in there to control them. Well, a microprocessor is just like a computer. It can communicate, which means all of our panels can talk to each other. So if one of them breaks for any reason, the other three or four around it can re you know, radio that in and say, send out a truck, there's something wrong. It also means they can communicate with cars traveling overhead. So if you put an RFID tag on a material hazard shipment, for instance, you can track that in real time. What else? Julie always wanted to be a veterinarian. We could save animals. And I don't know how it is in Sacramento here, but up where we're at, any given time on our own road, a moose, a mountain lion, a bear, anything can step out in front of you. There's a lot of vehicle and animal collisions. So I thought, how can we save the animals? Well, if we could put sensors in that road that the microprocessor can read to tell if there's something on it, then you can warn drivers before they go around that next curve and hit it. I'll show you a video of that later. Stormwater. We learned that a lot of, you know, stormwater is just rain that's falling on your house. It goes across your yard, picks up pesticides, picks up fertilizer, whatever you put on your grass, goes out in the street where that water is also picking up what fell out of the bottom of your car, oil, antifreeze, brake fluid, God forbid. Most places, this just goes right into a nearby body of water, be it a creek, a river, the ocean, Puget Sound, whatever, with no filtration at all. What if we could collect that water, move it to a filtration facility, turn that into potable water, and relocate that to a, an agricultural area, an aquifer, someplace that would be needed? What about those horrible overhead poles that ruin our landscapes? We actually have a lake across the street from our house which would be a beautiful scene, except the road goes between our house and that lake, and so does the power line. Really mars it. I'd love to get rid of that. Well, if you think about an electric road, in the shoulders we can put the power cables, we can put cable TV, we can put high-speed internet, we can put whatever you want in there. All those cables can come out of the air, out of the ground, and put in a box along the shoulder that can be accessed by the utility companies. We went to the University of uh, Idaho and talked to some instructors, some structural engineers there, and we talked about what it would take to support that glass structure in the trucks. And I said, would it matter if you're just making material you're going to rest your glass on? Is it, does it matter what it's made of? And he says, not really. We can, he says, why do, you, why do you ask? I said, well, in our studies, we learned that our oceans and landfills are filling up with plastic trash bags, uh, grocery bags, water bottles, tires. Can we grind all that up and mix it with something and make that internal support structure or other parts of these solar road panels? He said, yeah, we can mix it with organic materials and make whatever you want. So if you think about that, we've got over 25,000 square miles of asphalt surfaces in just the lower 48 states. If you cover those with something a few inches thick made out of recyclables, you're getting rid of a lot of trash. An electric road, just like the HO cars, little slot cars, can recharge electric cars. We're looking into ways of doing that while they're moving down the road, but right now, you could plug these things anywhere. If you have parking lots made out of these, you can plug them in a park, not recharge it while you're inside eating or shopping, whatever you're doing. Or you can put them in road, stop, road stops. Most electric cars, they're, they're one Achilles hill is you've got a range of maybe 100, 150 miles on the better cars. That means you've got about a 50 mile radius, and I'm not sure what's within 50 miles of here, but you've got to take it back home at night to recharge it typically. If you could put these on electric roads that are installed around a country, just parking lots and major fast food chains, for instance, you could use this to go all the way to Florida from here. So it becomes a practical car. So two things are happening. Businesses are retrofitting their parking lots with solar panels. People are trading in their internal combustion engines for what is now a practical all-electric vehicle. You're using less coal per, per energy for electricity, using less oil for your cars. We're starting to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels. So now we have all these great ideas, right? We, have, we hire our daughter's friend who's a graphic illustrator to do some drawings for us. Do some animations. Here's a panel all assembled, the lights being tested, the road lines being painted. Once the roads are in place or the panels are fixed, you put them in place in the road and you have what we call the solar roadway. This is an interpretation of what it looked like. This has been a spiritual journey for us, so we like to tell people on a mission from God. But now what? Julie's a therapist, I'm an engineer, we have zero marketing skills, we've never sold anything. 
we don't know where to go from here. So naturally, we start a website. <laughs> Ironically, treehugger.com is the first one that picks up our story. They run the story. Mark Dixon from yurt.com comes out and videotapes. If you've been to the website, you've seen an interview. That was a couple years ago. We start getting all kinds of emails, people asking questions, making suggestions, and people, other people running with us too. And we get an email from a company called Booz Allen Hamilton Corporation. We'd never heard of it. Sounded like an alcohol company. We thought maybe they want us to make <laughs> ethanol. We didn't know. A few days later, Julie looks it up and says, we better call these people. They turned out to be one of the, or the oldest and one of the biggest consulting firms in the nation. They invited us out to do a, a speech. When we were done, they asked us to build some models, and they now have four solar road panels in their future transportation lab for congressmen and senators and world dignitaries to walk through and look at. And they said it's a very popular attraction. While we were there, they were right across the river from DC. We thought, here's our chance. Let's make some appointments with senators or Congress. We've never done this before. We didn't know what the procedure was, but we got in to see a few of them. We learned that Washington works in 15-minute intervals. <laughs> you get an audience, you get in there, you've got exactly 15 minutes to plead your case, much like tonight. <laughs> At 14 minutes and 59 seconds, that door flies open, someone yells, Senator, we need you, and he's ushered out. You're done. When, we started picking, when the story started picking up on the internet, we learned about blogs. Not that we hadn't seen blogs before, they'd just never been about us before. We found that people either loved what we were doing or they hated it. And we learned we had to have thick skin. <laughs> so we couldn't let this get us down. And I started thinking about that. What if there had been an internet back at the turn of last century and the Wright brothers came out in, say, 1901 and said, we're going to make a flying machine. Can you imagine what the bloggers would have done with that? <laughs> They'd have raked him over the coals. And if they had listened to that and let that discourage him, we'd have all walked here tonight. <laughs> Early last year, we saw the United States Department of Transportation put out a solicitation for some kind of paving material that could pay for itself over its lifetime. <clears throat> Excuse me. We applied for it, and we got it. It was a phase one research grant. So typically, you just write papers to try to convince your audience you can build it. I called and I said, I'll do you one better. I know I can build it. Why waste money? I'll take that money, buy the parts, and build one. They said, OK. <laughs> we built a 12 foot by 12 foot prototype solar road panel. This is a close up of one of the cells. Those are LEDs. There's six, or I'm sorry, three white and three yellow for painting road lines. I'm just going to go a little further out. That's the full 12 foot by 12 foot panel with the lines painted. Like I said, we can write words in there. It doesn't have to be just roads. Our phase one contract, if we get phase two, will be to go into parking lots, because those are slow moving lightweight vehicles where we can learn our lessons rather than putting them out in the fast lane and see what happens. <laughs> but these panels can be used in places other than just roads. You can put them on bike paths. Here's a sample for a playground. You can put mazes on there. We could put four square, hopscotch, whatever we want in a, in a playground that playground could feasibly take the school off grid. This is a video of the kids jumping on a crosswalk panel. It sensed, there's sensors in that crosswalk panel, just like there would be for the deer. It senses when something is, is put pressure on its surface, and it warns the drivers up ahead, it wouldn't be in front of the kids, but way up ahead, to slow down. So this is where our journey has brought us so far. I watched, when I was preparing for this, I watched a couple of TED videos and I saw Al Gore talk about an old African proverb. He said, if you want to move fast, or the proverb says, if you want to move fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And Al went on to say, we need to go far and we need to go fast. And we completely agree with him. And every journey starts with one step. But what I've seen is baby steps. And I don't mean, you know, we're changing our light bulbs and that's great. Fluorescent bulbs are great. It's not going to solve the problem, but they're, they're a great idea. Carpools, that's great. Mass transit, wonderful. High mileage cars, beautiful. But these are honestly putting band-aids on an open, gaping, gushing wound that is global warming. And what we're offering is a tourniquet. This is our granddaughter. She's about the age that Julia and I were when we started this talk. And 50 years from now, she'll be my age and I'll be gone. I worry about the, the world we're going to leave behind. We're doing this for everybody's grandchildren, and I hope you'll join us on our journey.
God bless and thank you.